if inter internationalization is something that is part of your end game, this next gentleman, he's been on before, he's someone you've got to pay very close attention to because his company, Result, has assisted 300 companies to grow internationally. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together once again for Ola Alvarsson. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. So I'm back. This time I'm going to speak about my favorite topic, internationalization. And um, I said before I was a kickboxing world champion. I'm also Swedish. And Swedes have been good at internationalization ever since the Vikings. Uh, I even hear that my name Ola is the same as Olga and means holy. So it's an old Viking word that we brought to you guys. But uh, internationalization has a lot of different, different complexities, and it can really be the most value-creating thing you ever do in your company's life, but it can also be the most risky and stupid thing that you do in your company's life. I'll start out with a couple of words about my own entrepreneurship. My first idea was when I was sitting in the subway and I was reading the schedule for the trains, and I was thinking, why can't somebody do this a little bit more sexy? I was 17 years old, and I created what was then the first subway newspaper. It was called Metro under Stockholm. Is there a Metro here in the Ukraine? You have that in your subway? Yeah. I bought my first suit, I combed my hair, I went to the person at the Swedish subway authorities who was in charge for bad ideas. And I got to speak to her. And she listened for 10 minutes, and then she almost patted me on the head and said, that's a cute idea, but you don't know how to run a business, you don't know how to run editorial things, and your 20,000 euros that you can get from friends and fools wouldn't even pay for your legal cost. So that, my little friend, uh, won't happen. But keep on studying and be ambitious, and maybe you can get a job here at the Department for Bad Ideas at the Swedish Subway Authorities. So I went home, I killed the idea, and I knew that it wasn't going to happen. Four years later, my would-be editor-in-chief calls me and she says, there's some idiot that stole our idea. They're starting Metro. And now Metro is the largest daily newspaper in the world in subways in each continent. To date, that is the most important moment in my business life because that's the moment I realized that having an idea has no value if you can't connect it to the right people, the right execution, and the right circumstances. So since then, I've been trying to find just that. Um, the second uh, uh, company I was part of starting was a bulletproof vest factory. Uh, we were the first in doing <laughs> things like hardballs, the antibalistic growing cup, and other killer applications in the security industry. Our customers were Hells Angels, and then bandidos came very fast, and then the police came and said, anything going on, and then all kinds of other people. Then I realized, if you don't love the customers, and I didn't love this industry, that's probably not what you should be doing. But it's still around, the Swedish body armor group. Then internet came around, and I fell madly in love with internet. And the notion that there's a global market, you can sit in your office, and then all of a sudden you have customers all over the world. That's what we believed in those days. Of course, it's not so. If I tell you to name the four largest Swedish sites or the coolest e-commerce company in Belgium, none of you would have a clue. And that's how local the internet is. So business models are also local. There's fantastic models in one country that nobody knows about in the other country. And that's why it's so exciting with internationalization. Some of the best companies, some of the Googles of the world, from a business model perspective, could be sitting in Kiev or in Stockholm without others knowing about it. So, I fell in love with the internet, and we came up with a mad idea that you could actually sell something on the internet. This was in the mid-90s. And uh, just as a point of reference, in France, they didn't have internet. They had Minitel. They had a much better internet. It worked, right? So there was a debate whether we would have internet or not. In that market, we wanted to go out and sell things. There were no payment methods. There were no online clicks you could buy. Uh, the banner was just being invented. It was going to be called the flag. That was the first name. And in this market, we started building a company called Boxman, and we had, uh, in 97, about a million customers. We were about 40% of the size of Amazon, and we thought, we'll beat these guys. Jeff Bezos came to Stockholm, and we talked, and we were like, we're smarter than him. He doesn't understand Europe. We can grow faster internationally. So we walked away from that conversation, to date maybe the most expensive steps I've ever taken. Uh, 
and we embarked on taking our company from market to market. We did something very well, and that's a key takeaway. When you go international, try to find a replicable model so that you don't have to invent your company in every market. And our model was that since we sold music, we went to the biggest music stars in each country. So in Sweden at that time, it was ABBA, they're always the biggest music star, Roxette and Ace of Base, you know, I saw the sign and so forth. And we said, invest in this because this is the way music will be sold in the future. ABBA said no, the others invested. And then we went to the largest media owning family and we said to that family, invest in us because these companies will buy media in the future. You need to create that industry. So the Bonnier family in Sweden, another large media for the Otto family in Germany invested in the company. So whenever we went to a country, we had like an investor target list of super artists, media owners, the heaviest uh, banking families and whatever. So when we came to market, it felt like we were an industry. We had the same prices being a startup as the largest retail stores. And I, when we launched uh, with Bernard Arnault, the owner of LVMH, the luxury group in France, who made a small investment, I think we had 300 articles the first, the first two weeks when we launched. Boxman, the only site with French music and French books, safeguarding the French culture. So we found a very local print and we just duplicate the model everywhere and that's why we could grow so fast. What we had absolutely no clue about was how to build technology and nobody else back in those days. Bill Gates actually came to our company after three months of operations and said, we're the largest e-commerce company on a Microsoft platform. So after three months after starting the company, we're on the stage waving with Bill Gates. Okay, three months later, we changed supplier because absolutely nothing worked, nothing worked. And then IBM flew in and they developed their whole net commerce based on our platform and they had 100 developers and now nothing works. We had 60% downtime when we launched. So these were early days and logistics were very difficult. And that comes to the second point. Don't go international before your company runs well in your home market. It's super easy to go international on the whiteboard and then we take the US and then and for many companies that have a strong business model, that would be a strong business model in other markets as well. But it's very important to prepare first. And very often, if you're a young company, a dollar spent in your home market is much more valuable than a dollar spent in some remote market. So key point, make sure that operations work, you optimize, you do whatever you think you can do locally before you start looking internationally. Now, when you want to look internationally, there is uh, two models. One where we call it the proximity model. I would imagine that a lot of the Ukraine startups, they have in their business plans, and then we go to Russia, and then we go to Poland. Whereas if that would be a Norwegian company, they would say, and then we go to Sweden, and then we go to Denmark. There's absolutely no reason why a company in Argentina should go to Mexico, and then Brazil, and then Spain, because that's what their business plans say. Zoom out. Okay, and then you have the spaceman perspective. If you were a spaceman coming with your spaceship to Sweden with your business idea, would it be better to land in Beijing or would it be better to land in Helsinki? And if you have that perspective, you can then look at what are the market conditions and the potential without just going to the neighboring country. And when you explore those two models, sometimes you wind up in, no, we're Austrian, it's much better to go to Germany, the language, we understand the market, the partnerships, this makes a lot more sense. But at least to do that analysis and to think through how you go international. So that's the second advice. Prepare and do your homework, not, don't just run. If you imagine how many companies go international, because I met a guy in the bar at the conference and he says, I know everybody in Russia. So we started working with this guy. So by working with that person, you're not working with every other smart person that could help you into that market. And picking your partner is extremely important. If you go into Germany with Burda or with uh, Prosieben that knows everyone, or just some guy that you used to go to school with that speaks a little bit of German, it's a very big difference. So get the basics right, have a competitive advantage at home, do your analysis, not just pick the next market. And then now you're going international. And we've helped 
Throughout these 15 years, 300 companies go international, ranging from Google and LinkedIn and many companies that you know. And we have little offices around the world looking for local fast growers, and then we help them move to other markets. And one of the most common mistakes is that the CEO is so excited about the internationalization. So the CEO says, I'm going to lead this. And then we ask, could I see your agenda, please? What do you mean? Can I see your agenda? And you look at the CEO's agenda, and it looks terrible. And that person is going to be the one that takes care of all the new things happening in that market. So you need to allocate resources, preferably ahead of international. And that person needs to be very much in sync with everybody else, because internationalization affects every department, uh, and it affects uh, a lot of things in the home market that can slow you down at home because you need to develop the German site or deal with legal things in England, uh, and that can damage your local business. So the CEO is probably not the right person to do it. Then what usually happens is that they give it to the sales guy or the marketing guy, and then after a while, it becomes uh, a function of its own, somebody who's in charge of internationalization. Another very common mistake is that what made you successful in the Ukraine is that you know everybody, you have a background, you work day and night, you're four founders, everybody trusts you, you spend $2 million on building your company. And then you want to do the same thing in the next country. And there you want to hire somebody as cheap as possible, and they don't have your experience, and they don't have your uh, uh, clout in the market, and you hope that market would develop the same way as your own market did and it very seldom does. If you study companies, they're strong in their home market, weak in their other markets. And our first question is, are you doing the same things? Are you having the same conditions with you when you launch your idea? And very often, that is not the case. So an interesting exercise is to try to, what were the conditions that made me successful? Really try to see the secret sauce and try to duplicate that uh, before you go international. So, you know you're going to go international, you know which market you want to go to, and all these questions flows from why do you want to go international? Do you want to do it because you can't sell anymore at home, because there is a short window, otherwise somebody else will take the market? Do you want to do it because you think it's fun and cool, or because your investors tell you to? There are very different reasons of going international. If you're a company like Spotify or someone like that, you have to go international. You can never support the technology investments unless you go international. So for them, it's a question of how fast, where, and with which model. Zooming in on the models for going international, there's something called Greenfield, which is you go in, you pay, you do everything. There's nobody else doing anything. It's you. And for the most successful business models, that's how you should go international, at least in the long run. Google doesn't give away half the company in the Ukraine just because you helped them set up an office and, and, and set up some sales. So very strong business models often go international themselves. But there are exceptions. If you look at McDonald's, they have 28,000 franchise restaurants because they feel that they need local entrepreneurs and they lead, need uh, entrepreneurship on a restaurant level. So going in Greenfield is good if you succeed. But it's very difficult, you need to learn the market, you need to take the financial risk yourself, and you need to operate, especially if you go to many markets, these markets in parallel. Another alternative is to do a joint venture. And a joint venture feels very good. You meet somebody, they know their market, maybe they're strong like a media partner, and you create a local company together with them, and then you grow that company. And that has been a very successful model and a very unsuccessful model. And I'll try to outline some of the difference between when it goes to hell and when it goes really well. Uh, if you pick a partner that has this as a side interest rather than as a real focus, that is usually uh, a recipe for destruction. If you joint venture with somebody who's not successful in the market, so as a way to try to give them a second chance or their business is going down, but now they can do this with you. That's usually not uh, a very good recipe either. Um, there needs to be very clear ways of engaging and of separating if it doesn't go well. Uh, and very often you can get stuck in a joint venture. It's not moving, you can't push, and you have a partner that's not so excited. Uh, and the less the business develops, the, le the less excited they get, and then you can get stuck in a very bad situation. On the other hand, if you have somebody that's highly motivated, 
that have resources that you can use so that you can hit the ground running and that you can build a joint culture with that entity, maybe towards a full merger or something like that, or towards them selling back your, their shares in the local joint venture. It can be a very strong model. Also here, you need to think it through beforehand, so you come to them with a model rather than trying to invent it every time in every market. Other ways of going international. Um, now online, you can go on uh, international with just performance-based marketing, and you can s literally sit in your office. We started one company which uh, gathered all the poker players in the world to one common platform. The only thing we did was having 40 people search engine optimizing in each language in the world and doing performance-based marketing. So nobody traveled. We were in, I don't know, 180 countries, and we could actually run that from one place. There's quite few business models where you can do that, but if you can find those business models, then uh, I think there, what many people get stuck in is just their own language, their own marketing partnerships, their own target group. Here, I think zooming out would be uh, a very good exercise for many as well, because you can buy clicks a lot cheaper and customers a lot cheaper in other countries, potentially. So uh, now that you've launched You've decided on the model, with whichever model it is, you've launched in the other countries, you've got the company prepared, and you have an international company. There's a, something that I call the head office trap. Usually, the head office people, they've designed the internationalization, they've made the strategy, and they kind of think, without being arrogant, it's easy to think that they have all the good ideas, and then they tell that to the countries. Do this. This is how we do things. This is a great marketing campaign, and it's a one-way street. And if that is the case, you're going to have satellites that are pretty demotivated after a time because they see and they get a lot of good ideas and they get a lot of partnership opportunities. And if it was a two-way street, you could actually learn a lot from them that could be used in other markets. So depending on how you structure your internationalization, you need to have a lot of two-way communication, probably have international representation in your boards, probably hire people from a completely different country than yourself in the management team, and when you start doing that, you become an international company. But it's cumbersome because you have to have the meeting in English because one guy is uh, from England. You have to have a corporate language which is not your own anymore. And you have to do a lot of things on a much more uh, complex uh, model than just sitting a founder's team and making all decisions. But if you manage to do that, if you manage to get really good people that contribute to the whole of the company, then that uh, creates completely different uh, chances of success than trying to run all these different countries that you don't really know that well uh, at the same time. And a way to get to that is something that's called onboarding. So if you hire somebody in Sweden, you have your head office here in Kiev, you make those people work from Kiev and you onboard them and then they bring with them colleagues from here to Sweden that work from Sweden. So their friendship ties, everybody knows everybody in the organization and that you can work with that model. So how do you bring customers in? And uh, there's, there's uh, a lot of different business models, of course, range from B2B to B2C. But let's focus on business to consumer. And I think one of the interesting ways is what we heard earlier on today, media partnerships. Because right now, you have newspapers that are dying, you have TV stations that are uh, seeing that their core market is, is just becoming less and less interesting for advertising. And they are on the lookout for companies to take to their own market. So a good way is to find an investor that wants to back your internationalization. You find a media partner that wants to give you media and unfair advantages. And that's a good start for being able to pick up users uh, faster uh, than most others can pick up users. Because you have to have unfair advantages when you go international. There has to be something truly unique. Just launching a Me Too product of something that exists in the market very seldom becomes successful. Uh, if you look at the uh, venture capital side of things, very few international venture capitalists would invest in a Ukraine company focusing only on the Kiev region, right? So depending on what ambitions you have, and that's nothing wrong with that at all, uh, if you stay in your home market, you build a great business, you live of it, you give it to your grandchildren, or you sell it, that's fantastic entrepreneurship. But at the same time, if you want to build something global, it's kind of like being in the Olympics. You can't train two times a week and you know, hope to get on the team. 
a great international venture capitalist, they want to have ambitious plans. They are aware that you will most likely fail, but they have a portfolio, so it's okay for them. So when you get into that game, you will have to have very ambitious plans. And what happens then is that you start attracting ambitious investors, and then you can hire ambitious colleagues, and then you can get ambitious partnerships. So there's very much a wave like mo uh, motion between ambition and getting the resources to at least try those ambitions. Uh, Sweden, we call it Silicon Valhalla. We have, I think, per capita in Stockholm, the highest outside uh, Silicon Valley, the highest value creation in the digital space. Uh, Skype was created there, um, Spotify, Klarna, Mojang, that creates Minecraft, was sold for $2 billion the other day. I think there are 10 employees or something like that. And we have just a range of companies coming out of that region. King.com, that did mine uh, um, Candy Crush, you know, 5 billion IPO. And why is that so? Why is it that that happens in Stockholm and Sweden? Well, we have one other industry that is like that, and that's the music industry. So it started with the ABBA, and since then we have the Acer Basis and Roxettes and whatever they're called, uh, Avicis and Swedish House Mafias and so forth. And the reason is that Swedish musicians are very ambitious and they go international and think international from day one. There's no such thing as a local Swedish success. And the same is true for the startups. Everybody has an international plan. Everybody thinks about going international from the start. And that has created a lot of Im ambitious investors that go into the region and a lot of people that wants to work with the companies. So if I bring this back into uh, sort of some sort of summary, Internationalization is the most important thing to succeed with. But don't do it until you are very safe that your model can scale and that your model has competitive advantages. When you know that you have that, start exploring the international market. Go to places like this in other countries. Start engaging with advisors and others that have done the trip before. And when you're ready to do your homework, Spend some time on the homework. I hate sort of consulting reports. That's not what I'm after. But really try to understand how would you prioritize the market? What markets are there? And that's not necessarily the closest market. When you have decided on where to go, start exploring those markets. Go there, talk to the people, and define a model that is based on your overarching goals. Is it a joint venture? Is it you go in yourself? Could you sit and do it at your home and just market uh, into these markets without having much on the ground? Could you just have a sales representative? These things will become clearer and clearer as you go closer to, 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 uh, to making, your, making your bet. And once you do, don't believe that your CEO can do it, or you send in the B team, or you hire somebody who is cheap, or you can do it on a rev share basis, sitting on a banana box. If it works, it works, because it won't work. You really need to focus on the international project. You need to be as passionate and entrepreneurial as you were in your own ho home market. And when it starts working in one market, see what you can duplicate and move to the other markets. And usually, the first baby is painful. The first market, there's a lot of things that needs to be done. But the second time, the baby comes a little bit easier. And then you will see that over time, uh, it's called the Uppsala model. It's a Swedish professor that wrote about it. You go to your own market, it takes, uh, or the neighboring market, it takes a couple of years and it's painful. And then you can go to a couple of markets. And after a while, you have a model where you can do a lot of things at the same time in many markets, like a Salando or like uh, some of these other companies that we've seen. I've been speaking a lot about the problems and challenges about the internationals. Okay. Now I'll just end with some words about how cool it is to see your little logo that you created on a banner over another country, or you have your opening party in New York and you read about yourself in New York Times, or you see that people from all over the world are gathering in your meeting room and they're saying, oh, in Japan, go very well. And then you hear the other guys, Finns, they say, oh, it's not bad here either. And you see you're sitting in the mix of that and you're creating something truly international and global. And it's never been easier to do it. It's never been cheaper to do it with the technology and the marketing and everything else that we're building. And in my vision, we're going to move into an era of hyper innovation. We have 50 billion connected devices. You know, by 2020, somebody said at Ericsson. So everything will be connected. 
We're going to have two and a half million, two and a half billion people to more joining the party that doesn't have internet today. And we're going to be able to sell and buy from these guys. We're going to have language technology enabling us to speak with each other and communicate, not just Google Translate, but actually talk to each other. And we're going to have cloud computing so we don't have to pay for expensive computers. So in this world, I think there'll be fantastic opportunities to go international. So there's absolutely no reason to sit here and think locally if you have the greatest business idea out there. So with that, I'd like to uh, end for today. I'm going to be around here. So if you have the greatest business idea in the world and want to go international, we can talk about that. Thank you very much for listening.